So the other day, I was thinking about how to improve my relationships with some of the people around me. So I went to the exact same place you go, went online, and I typed at the top, um, improving my relationships, how to improve my relationship. And here are the top ones that came up. Here's how to know if you're in a toxic relationship. Uh, hump day, seven signs you're in a rebound relationship. Seven tips for being less jealous in your relationship. An interview with Justin Bieber. Uh, uh, Eleven red, I'm just going down the list. Eleven, they have these little pictures by them. They're, they're really nice. Eleven red flags you should never ignore according to Oprah's relationship experts. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't go down this far. This is kind of cool. Ooh, here's Taylor Swift. A complete timeline of Taylor Swift and Joe A-L-W-Y-N's relationship. Alwyn's, is that what it says? Uh, anyway, this is what you people go to to learn stuff? <laughs> Th this is awful when I go through here. Why would I click into any of this stuff? Now, we joke about this and we, when, we, when we look, but when it comes to life, when it comes to true relationship, this is something God has been at work at throughout. Do you want to improve the relationships with your boyfriends, girlfriends? Do you want to improve your relationship with God? Do you want to improve your relationship with the people around you? Do you want to improve your relationships in your family, your friends, your neighborhood? I wouldn't go here. I just wouldn't. When we first started out, I talked about this wonderful story, the Bible. And if you look at it, the very first part, let me just see here, John, if I can cut this thin. I think it's here. This part of the Bible is about us being in a perfect relationship with God in a perfect place. The rest of it is the recovery. It is God trying to work that relationship back in us to try and bring us joy, to bring us life, to connect us back together again and more. This is just where they said, you know, we're just going to stop at this point. To this very day, it's been about reconnecting that relationship. And today we fall upon something incredibly important because in a way they asked Jesus about this. They asked him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest piece of our faith? What's the meaning of it all? Like, we do all of this stuff. Like, what's the point of all of this? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, some of you have heard this a lot. Some of you are just hearing it for the first time. Do you see what's important out of this? Love and heart come straight out of Jesus' mouth. This isn't a command. This isn't law. This is about a relationship. This is about connecting with one another. So when we're talking about the vertical relationship with God, that affects all of our horizontal relationships. It affects who you are, how you relate to your spouse, how you relate to the people around you. And sometimes we forget that the originator taught us what to do. He gave us this wonderful list. Yes, it's law, no doubt, but in it are these promises in this way that we can live a good life and connect with the people around us. But again, love, heart, and then soul, and then mind follow. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love neighbor. You're seeing relationship in front of everything else. This is so important. And then he comes out and says it. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything hang on this relationship building project. Well, what are these commandments? Where, where is all this pointing to? Well, these are the Ten Commandments that we're going to be covering today. And may I ask this of all of you who are learned, there are many in this room that I would listen to on this subject, okay? Uh, when I was looking at my marriage, I wanted to find that 60-year-old marriage or that 80-year-old couple that are holding each other and walking down the street. You know, how did he trick her into staying with her that long and to helping them? I, I want to go talk to those who have been in these relationships, who have lived their life, and talk about the ups and downs of life and how that works and their faith. And so for you today, how many of you have heard of the Ten Commandments? Go ahead and raise your hand. I'm, I, I can't see you, so raise your hand. Yes, all the lights. Very good. All of us. 
I pretty much heard about the Ten Commandments. All right, uh, you grab the bulletin so you could take sermon notes. On the back, I want you to write out for me really quick all the Ten Commandments in the proper order for me, would you really quick? That should take, I've timed it, took me about 40 seconds. So I can burn that time, go. Not hearing writing. For something so critical and so massive, there's something very important for us not to lose. Oftentimes, we, we hear about these, and we hear about it in the news, them being taken down, or we've heard about these in different points of our life, and we've said, okay, I, they've made me memorize them. I was punished by memorizing these things. I'm just going to chuck these things in the corner and be done with them. We can't. We need to remember these. And so, adults, parents, those who want to learn and really deepen your life and relationship, this is the time. So take a look at these Ten Commandments again and spend a lifetime really studying them and taking a look at them. Because do we know them? Do we live them? Do we share them? Do we make them part of our life? <laughs> and yet all of your relationship hangs upon the understanding of these. Well, we've been crooning along in the Bible, and uh, we've kind of moved through that very first part, and now we're moving through Abraham, Joseph, now we're parked in Moses, soon to be Joshua next week. And they've marched out of Egypt. If you look at the book, the, the story, and the front cover, you're going to see this map, and, and we're going to end up at Mount Sinai today. We're going to hear this proclamation, and God would speak directly to the people. If you like other maps, uh, kind of see the route they're taking. So as they exit us out of Egypt, they're slowly moving down through the water points uh, down to Mount Sinai, which is at the bottom of that middle spear pointing downward. And so they are here, and now God needs to reconnect them to Him. He's starting over again. He's speaking so that they would know Him and understand Him and know the relationship. And it starts off just like this. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord who took you out of Egypt, who saved you. I am the Lord your God. Now, listen, I need you to focus. Pay attention. I am the Lord your God. I am the I am. I am the creator. I am God, the true God. I am everything, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-knowledgeable. I am God. Now, if you look in the Scriptures, most people don't know this, God spoke the Ten Commandments to the people. Moses didn't have to go up and get them on a tablet. He did that later. God spoke this directly to the people, and they collapsed. As soon as they heard God and felt His presence, they collapsed in shame and fear in the presence of that much goodness. Compared to who they were, they collapsed. And God spoke this wonderful peace, and I think we, we collapse today in not hearing it. This awesome, incredible God then gives Himself to us. I don't want us to miss that. Because the commands are not just finger pointing. They are loaded with relationship. I am the Lord, your God. I'm giving myself to you. Isn't that awesome? That's how the Ten Commandments start. It's about a relationship, him reaffirming and committing himself to his people. And I'm yours. So, if, if you have the true God, the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God himself, creator, saying he's giving himself to you, then what's the first commandment? <laughs> you don't need any others. I got you. Yes, they are law, but do you see the gift that God gave leading up to this? I'm giving myself to you. Don't worry about all that other garbage. I got you. So you shall have no other gods before me. You won't need them. When we commit to people, this is so important, not only in our commitment to God, but you need to make promises. You need to make commitments with one another. I, of course, had a maximum commitment when it came to my wife, but we commit to friends. I committed to the soldiers around me during that time of my life. I commit to other staff members. We commit to projects. I commit to people all the time, and I need to follow through on those. Making commitments and keeping commitments are huge, and God is giving Himself to you saying, I'm committed, I got you. So yes, you shall have no other gods before me, but the great I am, everything, this great I am, and everything that comes with it, he will provide for everything we need. I am everything, and I'm going to give you everything. Isn't that amazing? God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and the glory of Christ Jesus. He's going to deliver the goods to you. 
He's committed to you. We need to be committed to others the same way, and to God Himself, of course. Okay, so God gave Himself to us. And so if you want to create a relationship with someone and they've committed to each other, I suppose they should know your name. And so God gives us His name. Moses asked, what is your name? They won't know who I am. Who are you? They won't, they won't believe me. What's your name? The great I am, Yahweh. Tell them I am sent you. He gave us His name. And you know, then He promised. Every time you use the Lord, of the, God, uh, the Lord God's name, something will happen. Every time. Every time I say, Lord, God, Yahweh, I am, something is happening. His word is movement. It's action. When God speaks, it becomes what it is. None of the words of the Lord come back to him empty. So when you say, Lord, God, he is listening and something is happening. That's an incredible gift. And so, if God has given that to you, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. It's such a powerful thing to have. When you call upon the Lord, He is present, He is listening, something is happening. <laughs> that's an amazing gift, but don't misuse it, right? And so that's why we protect God's name, because of how powerful it really is. Every time you use His name, something happens. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We have that. All right, so if he's given himself to us, we don't need anyone else, and we have his name. Well, now that you have his name, what does God want us to do? Use it. <laughs> if you want to have a relationship with someone, you know their name and address, or you know where they are, you talk. And so, what's the next? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Let's spend some time together, says God. Use my name. Bring your family together. Bring your friends together. Let's worship together. Let's talk together. Let's spend some time together. Remember this incredible gift, right? And just like in the friendships around us and family, we need to spend that time. I am with you always. The great I am is close to you. He is present in your life. No other time like 2020 has taught people that just being around people, what that meant, just being present, having God say, I am there, being present for those in need, right? Now, guys can be a little bit different than others. I have these relationships where we don't really talk much. We just get together to experience things, like we fix stuff, we, we watch things, we go to events. We really don't say a lot. And when I get home, my wife always asks, so what did you guys talk about? Mm -hmm. Stuff. You know, it, it, it isn't important. What matters is presence. When I see people holding hands, when I see sisters talking to one another so close, when I see people giving hugs or spending, that matters, doesn't it? And your God not only says, you need to do that to one another, but He says, I'm there for you just like that. We need to have that closeness. So He teaches us that is where we need to go. Isn't that cool? And Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm there with you. I've got you. Commands and law, yes, we need to be doing this. And it just exposes us for who we are. We can never have this type of perfect relationship, but we work on it. We see what God is doing in our life. All right. After he sets up this wonderful, intimate relationship with God, he starts working on our first neighbors. He starts working on family and friends. And so this one, kids and all of you are kids if you have parents, are for you. Now, honor your father and mother, he says. And this one, I don't even have to bring up the promise because he just comes out and says it, so that you may live long in the land the Lord God is giving you. God has put nurturers in your life to raise you up. God is a nurturer. He wants you to see the blessings of whoever was your parents in your life, those mentors, those leaders in your life. God put them there on purpose, and He commits to continuing to do that in your life to the very last breath. You're going to have important people around you that will be caring for your life, and God wants that for you. And He says, why? So that you may live long in the land I'm about to give you. It's important, right? Now, the second is for the parents. I never understood why these two were together until I had parents or kids myself. You shall not murder. So the first is for the kids, the second is for the parents. Because there are times, I don't want to kill them, just maybe like take a little off the shoulder or, you know. You see that to this very day, 
you want to know what the number one motive for murder is? Interfamily disputes. There is nothing like a family member to be able to poke you in the wrong place, to jab at you, to draw you out. There's nothing like a family member that can bring you down and really rattle you up because they know you and they see beyond the facade and they poke and they rip. On top of that, those connections of family members, when you've committed to one another and you betray that, that inspires the deepest, darkest emotion that God put in there because He gave us that love and we betrayed Him, didn't we, in the Garden of Eden? And so God says, I don't want that. And so we see in murder this emphasis on cherishing life, okay? You shall not murder. You should not hurt or maim or hurt others, yes? You shall not murder. You should cherish life. The I am cherishes your life, and we are to cherish life. When people come and, and ask and talk about, um, you know, capital punishment or the death penalty, or when we talk about abortion, uh, this is one of the commands, one of the teachings that we lift up in these conversations, that we are to cherish life. And so it informs us as we move forward and as we talk about these as a people. God says, you know, this is one of this wonderful piece in Psalms, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God fearfully and wonderfully made you. He cherishes your life, and so we should cherish those around us. We should care and cherish for them. And that's so important, right? You see, yes, there are commands, but do you see the promises and the deep relationship to allow us to have a, a beautiful and fruitful life? They're, they're just amazing. You shall not commit adultery. Like I said, this leads to some of the greatest when you betray these commitments, especially uh, marriage is lifted up, of course, here with adultery. But when you have deep commitments and you break them, or even worse, when you know others have deep commitments and you help break them. When you see a committed thing and, you, and you're part of breaking that up, both to God is not good. God is going to commit to you. He is going to fulfill His promises to you, and He's going to honor that relationship. And He wants that to do that with others, right? Joshua's going to go through a lot, and we're going to talk about that next week. But at the end of his life, you hear something that he should have learned at the beginning, but that's not how life works. He says, you know with all our hearts and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. God is going to honor his relationship with you. He's going to fulfill his promises, every one of them. And he wants us to do that in kind. We are to do that for one another. These are good. I didn't need to ask Justin Bieber for this. I just go back to scriptures. Um, and I didn't need to learn about Taylor Swift's ex-boyfriend or whatever either in the process. You shall not steal. God has promised to supply you what you need in your daily bread. And when we steal from someone else, we break down that. We take what God has given us to live out our daily life, to be able to follow His commands in our life. And so, this is the basic of pieces. You shall not steal because He's going to provide something to you. He is going to give you something to own. For some, it's much. For some, it's less. But all of it is to fulfill His will in your life, right? And so, we do not take from others, whether it's from someone with much or someone with little or any of that, because it's there for a reason, and God is using that. And so, God promises to provide everything you need to support your body and life. And we need to honor what God has given to others and help protect that as well. And thank Him for that, right? And again, you should not give false witness against your neighbor. Boy, when I grew up, your name was what you lived as a man to, to I guess, develop. When someone said my name, you wanted it to be honorable. You wanted the name to hold weight. A, a handshake was all I needed. I, I had a person's word, and, and I tried to commit to making that happen throughout my life. Now, of course, we have other people in society that puts it on paper, and we sign things, and, and we do other pieces, but it was so important that we honor our word and that we do not slander others, because God is not going to do that to you. God is not going to talk about you behind your back to someone else uh, to rip you in two. He's straightforward. He will always speak the truth, and He is open and honest to you. There's the truth. Mark, did you go to school today? Yes, Dad, there was school. 
Now, he just spoke truth, but if you're a parent and you're listening, what didn't he say? (laughs) Did you go to school or not? He wasn't open and honest with me. And so, not only does God speak truth, but he opens himself up so that you know the depth. He promises and commits for you to hear and to grow and to develop. He wants that for you. But He also wants that for you and others when you interact with others, when you talk with others. It's important for us to do this, right? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know how hard that is for some people to hear that that is the only way through Jesus Christ? But then they turn around and say, but it is a way. (laughs) You have a way. That's the joy. He is open and honest. Of course, we now get to the covets. I just kind of stuck them both together. Coveting is a powerful tool. It is a human frailty that I may, in my life, in my last careers, exploit it a bit. Um, Sometimes when you want to get people to commit to buying something, uh, you use everything you can. And I personally didn't lie to do any of that, but as just... As the United States, oftentimes with, with some of the tools that we have at our disposal, we can really bend your ear to make you commit to do one thing or another. Let me give you an example of coveting, wanting what you don't have. Uh, do you know how many seasons my grandmother had when it came to the retail season for clothes and whatnot? Do you know how many seasons my grandmother had? Two, warm and cold. Do you know how many seasons my mother had? Four. Now you had, you know, summer, fall, winter, and spring. Do you know how many seasons we work with now? What do you think? 52. We have 52 seasons in the retail world. So this week, we're going to convince you that this is the latest and greatest, and you need this. And by the start of next week, we need to be ready to say, that isn't good enough anymore. This is what we have for you this week. It is a constant process. It is exhausting. (laughs) But you know what? I'm not mad at those folks. They are just better at saying yes than we are at saying no. Uh, I'm not not mad at all about that. Just be aware that our, our society really does focus on this coveting bit. God, though, says, I've got what you need to be content and happy. I can deliver that to you. God protects your heart. And he brings true contentment and peace like nothing else can happen in your life, okay? I've seen people that are in sod houses, for goodness sake, sod houses around the world who are perfectly happy. I've seen those with lots of possessions that are perfectly happy but also miserable in trying to maintain it all. It's all about what God has put into your life and only he can bring contentment and peace, okay? And God says, help those around you do the same. Be there. Isn't that cool? Don't covet it. Celebrate with them. I'm going to say this last piece about these commands, these relationships, these guidelines, okay? I know it's bold. This is my hot take if you listen to sports. When we do all these commands, when we follow these guidelines, both in the developing relationship with God and those around us, all our conflicts and wars are cut off at the source. They're all cut off at the source. These commands, especially the two Jesus gave, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and the second is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. These commands are a declaration of peace with all people. This is where it begins. This is God reconnecting. <laughs> Please don't throw them in the corner. They're worth a lifetime of reading and developing and looking at these incredible gifts and promises of God. Isn't it cool? So the Ten Commandments definitely shape the community, both in order, but also just in love, in life, in relationship with God and with others. These great commands are the greatest command that Jesus talked about, right? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is so important. It's love, it's relationship, it's connection. Jesus gives this guideline for our relationships, for those around us. And just as God gave us these guidelines and promises, 
Jesus then came and he died and he lived and he modeled them for us in the sacrificial love in our life. When we find how far we fall short of these guidelines, we need help. And that's where Jesus comes in. As flawed and imperfect and sinful and rebellious as we are, because of God's work in our life, we, you, have hope. Christ Jesus has a promise for you, just like in the commands. He sacrifices for you, and He works with you constantly. Christ Jesus is with you. He's sharing life with you. And hopefully, we are spreading that life, that same life, around us throughout the world. <laughs> I'm so glad He wants to connect with us and stay connected with us. And I thank Him for it. Amen. I'm going to have to figure out who Taylor Swift's boyfriend is. I'm curious about that timeline. What would my timeline be like with my wife, I guess? I have to think about that. Well, one of the pieces that is timeless for us is, of course, God in our life. And we asked him one time, how should we pray? It's a good question. Because who's going to be listening to this prayer? Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus, how should we pray? And he gave us this beautiful, again, guideline for life. <laughs> know who God is, find out what he wants in our life, then ask for what we need to make it happen, and then learn to work with others because you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Let's join in the Lord's Prayer together.